All right, how's everyone going? Do it today. I know it's the end of the day. It's like uh, a long weekend of lots of talks. So um, feel free to ask questions as we go, and I'll have dedicated time at the end to answer whatever um, uh, didn't get covered during the talk. Uh, but the, the, the main goal of this is to kind of go over different ways to uh, use Drupal in a different uh, enterprise scenario. So different ways to mash it up. Um, go back. Here. So my name is John Royal. So uh, founder and CTO of Royal Labs. Uh, so Andy and I are, are Royal Labs, and we build a lot of interesting things for, for different people. Um, some involve Drupal, some don't. Uh, but we've definitely done some interesting mashups of different technologies. You know, whatever fits the need of the individual client. Um, sometimes it's Magento or Drupal or 100% custom. It really just kind of comes down to what are they trying to accomplish. Um, the, a lot of these co the code examples will be on GitHub. Uh, the final, final code, I've still been tweaking the last day or two, so uh, I'll put that one up uh, hopefully in the next day or two. Uh, but there's a lot of code already available on GitHub. All right, so kind of overview what's gonna, what I'm going to go over, just kind of dive into what is a mashup, kind of a, I'm sure a lot of you already know, um, kind of just give, give a high level. Um, some pros and cons of why you'd want to even consider not just keeping something 100% native to one environment. Um, dive pretty deep into uh, individual Drupal mashups, um, and then really go into code on how to create your own. And surprisingly, especially with some of the tools that, that we've been working on, it's pretty easy. It's a lot easier once you know the tricks. <laughs> some of the tricks where hours and hours of frustration, uh, but once it's done, you don't really have to think about it. All right, so what is a mashup? Um, in an enterprise scenario, it's, it's literally trying to take different components, different packages, and squash them together. Uh, usually it's taking um, some useful set of features from one and useful set of features from another and adding your own logic and pulling it all together. So, uh, there are some, I think there's some the pretty strong pros. Um, some people always think it has to be 100% native. I tend to disagree depending on what the goal is, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so advantages, you can, you can leverage other software. So why recreate the wheel? Um, there are other ways, say you're using Drupal, you can create a module, suck in the data. Uh, you're still in the Drupal ecosystem and you're integrating. Sometimes that's not enough or sometimes that's too much work. Um, so I, I think that's where a, a mashup comes in. Um, if you have a legacy system, you really want to, say, use views. You have some, some great content and a lot of people contributing. But you have this old legacy app that you just don't have the time or budget to rewrite. And, and they've seen some pretty crazy code. You probably don't even want to touch it. <laughs> if it works, don't, you know. It, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, kind of thing. Um, so there could be ways you could consider a mashup where you're not killing uh, the old, old system. Um, especially on the front end, um, if you have uh, some non-Drupal developers who are available to work, why leave them out of the mix? Or make them spend three months getting up to speed? There are ways they can um, start writing code that they've been familiar with you know, from, from day one. Uh, I think that's one of the big advantages. So one of the, one of the examples we'll show later, the person who did the front end, uh, outside of just hitting save on a node, he didn't know anything about Drupal. And he created a really nice, uh, well-written front end for it. Okay. Uh, the power, if you really like administering things with Drupal, it's very flexible ACL. You can create users. You can add them into groups. Um, you can restrict content. Uh, a lot of great features that are a decent amount of work to recreate. So why recreate them? Have Drupal manage your, your data, your users, whatever you want, um, and, and suck it into the front end in some straightforward and not straightforward ways. Um, some people who come from MPC architecture, uh, they get really annoyed with Drupal. <laughs> so this kind of allows a little best of both worlds. Um, when it comes to commerce, a, a really a, a lot of large enterprise commerce would never consider uh, Drupal commerce for better or worse. 
uh, there are some pretty large Drupal Commerce users, um, but a lot of brick and mortar stores and some others, it, it's a tough sell. Um, so if you're using, say, Magento or even a larger system, you could still try to use uh, Magento with it. Disadvantages. Um, it's not uh, a magic bullet. It's not perfect. Um, to, you know, it could allow, it could require you to have a lot more knowledge about the inner workings of, um, say, the API of Drupal or even PHP as a whole. Um, but it really kind of comes down to the next part is <coughs> how you structure it and kind of putting some thought into the mashup really can pay dividends in the long run. Um, I've seen some, actually one of the examples, some of the code in there that I did not write um, kind of came into the mix and it's not the prettiest thing and, and it was a real pain to, to maintain. Um, but the overall mashup was still a success in, in a lot of ways. Um, you might need uh, some people with both traditional hardcore MPC and uh, hardcore Drupal. And if that's the scenario, it could be difficult uh, just having the amount of resources needed on both sides. Sometimes um, I definitely work with folks that, that do both. I feel like I, I, I can do both fairly well. Um, but some people really prefer one or the other. Uh, the last part, if you're trying to do something very fancy, you do have to dig into Drupal Docs, and, and you are going to have to become familiar with the API and how to search for different functions. Um, the nice thing about Drupal, as opposed to, say, WordPress, it has a pretty nicely laid out internal API. So before going into web services or what have you, um, it's not uh, necessarily the easiest thing to find, but once you get used to the style, I, I find it's, it's pretty helpful. I was <laughs> Actually, earlier today, I was trying to find some WordPress equivalents, and it was just... They didn't exist, but it was, was not very apparent. You know, just general theming functions, functions, things like that. Um, not every package is going to include those. Um, so I, I, I kind of think there's three kind of high-level ways to perform something like this. Um, if you really wanted to take Drupal and mix it in with another system, um, one of the one approach is headless, and I think there's been a couple of talks this weekend on different approaches for that. Um, the next one is web services. I think that's a really common approach where uh, you can wrap internal workings with some sort of web service layer, um, and then your app makes uh, either an AJAX call or an API call to um, uh, Drupal via web services. And, and it works really well. I've done that with, with Flash apps, and people have done it with mobile apps. Um, it's pretty powerful. Uh, the third one is a lot more complicated. It's very specific to certain enterprises. Um, only I had a chance to do it once, uh, but it was kind of fun to build. Drupal maintained all the content, uh, had some elaborate rules on it, it was uploading photos. Everything actually literally got published to a, another API, and the other API was the master, and it pushed out everything to the front end. So it, it, it's similar to the web service approach, except that you're not really serving directly from Drupal, you actually have some sort of middleman, and usually it's just a larger API or some sort of uh, aggregator. So this is one where we did a headless. And I actually did it, there was a couple little gotchas we found with, with uh, Drupal. Outside of that, everything went fairly straightforward. On the administration side, we set up a lot of um, uh, you know, some, some basic content types, added some different, um, uh, some different options for sizing the images. I'll open it up right now. And so it's a, overall, it's not um, a very complex site, but the idea was how do we get this out quickly and how do we have these really nice slideshows? And there's two different slideshows. One was, I think, a bootstrap slideshow, if I'm not mistaken, and one was... Um, um, it, it, it's cannot remember right now. Um, but it was a wholly uh, different set of systems. So neither of which at the time were supported inside of Drupal. So we would have had to create a module or, or some theming to integrate the two. Oh, so it's, it's a foundation. So it was a foundation-based um, slideshow. So here we have two different slideshows, not necessarily compatible. 
Um, a lot of just big blocky content. Uh, the designers were really, they really wanted everything to adhere to their look and feel. Um, but at the same time, they didn't have a huge budget. So kind of thinking if we, kept, we could do this all native, it would probably be double the budget. Uh, the really good front end guy I had at the time, um, he would not have been able to pull off a Drupal front end like this really quickly. Um, it would require some advanced theming. And, um, none of the other really good Drupal themers I knew at the time were available either. So it was kind of, all right, let's, let's, let's do a mashup. Um, you know, one of the side effects of, of it was it runs pretty quickly. Um, they have it uh, running very little resources now. Kind of yeah, it's um, I, actually I think it's just raw. It's not even using Bootstrap. So um, the the guy is the, the 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 one who actually did the markup. He's really into writing <laughs> his own kind of very lean, very specific markup. So he used some of his own conventions, but he didn't want to use Bootstrap or uh, Foundation directly. Okay. So everything was just very specific. And, <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes, no. which, which is kind of more of a rarity these days, but, you know, he could pull it off, so <laughs> we'd usually let him. Um, you know, it's just, you know, simple grids at the end of the day, um, and they still, you know, keep these maintained. Uh, they keep the site up. Uh, they were going to turn it into a big e-commerce store, and they just were like, this is fine. We drive all the traffic to our retail stores, and... We'll deal with e-commerce down the road. Uh, so all in all, I think it was a really great uh, learning experience for um, trying to do some Drupal mashups. Let's go to the next one. So this uh, K-Swiss was one that was uh, in the... Um, web services realm. So there were web services wrapping Magento, web services match wrapping Drupal, and a Kohana front end pulled everything together and pushed it out. So they had videos that were updated every week. They had um, celebrity endorsers, all kinds of crazy stuff. The latest version of K-Swiss I just found out today um, is all native Magento now. <laughs> they they uh, unfortunately were at a point where they spent so much creating the content and maintaining the system that manage the content, they, I think they cut the budget in half and were able to go native. So it's not as rich as it used to be, but they did a really great job. So unfortunately, I can't show you some of the cool things we did. Um, and my dev site is very, very outdated. Um, but uh, for at least you know a couple years, they had it up and running with that kind of hybrid solution. Um, the, the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was it was doing it on the server side, but it was basically Kohana was acting as the front end. It was doing all the layouts. It was pulling the data. You know, had all the JavaScript and CSS. So it was um, on that side of things. Everything was um, whatever uh, Kohana convention was. This is you know, we put files here. And blah blah blah. So the publishing scheme was one I did um, a few years back when uh, was at Beachman. And Beachman serves a lot of, uh, I guess, social commerce. They had Jewel Mint and Style Mint and Shoe Mint, uh, a whole bunch of different mints. <laughs> so one of their challenges was how do you, uh, by the time we started using Drupal, we had already abstracted uh, Magento out. So there was no native Magento theming. Everything was done at the time in Zend on the front end, uh, custom theme, Magento, uh, the custom API wrapping Magento. So then the idea was, all right, there's a lot of different pieces on the page where uh, the marketing team wants to be able to swap things out. They want to update all the footer pages regularly. How do we make that really easy? So that's where we had the publishing scheme where Drupal literally um, it would push to the central API, and the central API would serve it out. So this, this site right here is actually running Node. So using the same API, which hasn't changed uh, from structure-wise, 
uh, in a while. Um, you know, I don't know for sure anymore, but at one point this was all being served from Drupal. Um, so I'm pretty sure most of these pages still aren't. Um, and they, they were able to leverage it. They have you know, multiple sites, multiple maintainers. Uh, they were able to kind of leverage the best, best of both worlds. And at the time, they had a big budget for it, too. So um, it's, I don't necessarily recommend that approach. It's very expensive, very time consuming. Um, and it can be very prone to error. So I mean, why mashup? I think we had enough of that today. <laughs> kind of move on to the, the next topic. Um, uh, how do you make your own? So I'm going to show you more of the headless approach. Uh, I think that's the most practical one and gives you most bang for your buck. You don't have to wrap what you want to do in a web service first, then digest it somewhere. Um, you can literally load up Drupal under the hood, um, make whatever API calls you want to make. Uh, I can do a load node, uh, or I'm sorry, node load, and give it a number, I get one back. Uh, so it's very straightforward. You can even mix and match different theming engines. So uh, you could use your Drupal node template um, as well as whatever templating engine you're using on the other side of things. So in, in our case, it'll be a, a MVC micro framework, uh, but you can use Laravel, you can do Symfony. There's a lot of, using almost the same exact code, you can make it work in, in, in all of those different frameworks. So, now to, uh, assuming you guys are still interested in, in learning more, um, you know, what, what to go into, you know, what is a deco and how does it help? So if we go back here, I think I skipped a step. Oh, so how do I do all this? So using some ready-made components, um, you could either, you know, gut it, take some of that code and write your own solution, or you could literally just take the module as is and, um, start getting onto the more interesting part, which is how do I pull stuff from Drupal and make it look the way I want it to look. So it's a pretty simple process. Um, I won't go into the whole details, but there are some readme docs that explain a lot of it. Uh, the code samples might have some of that already done for you. But generally, just download, install it as you would, uh, drop it in the lib folder, then using Composer, um, install the module. So, this would be assuming you already have a composer-capable uh, framework ready in place. Uh, if you don't, you could always use Erdico. And Erdico is something uh, we've been working on for the last couple of years and just recently re uh, completely remodeled the whole thing. So we made it 100% composer compatible and a lot more lightweight and just kind of hopefully easier to use. Um, Changing things to leverage Composer actually required a lot larger rewrite than we originally thought would. Uh, but I think in the end, it, it's night and day. I think once Drupal gets fully Composer compatible, um, you can see some really interesting stuff happening. Uh, right now, I think Drupal 8 uh, it will have partial support. You know, Maybe by later versions or by 9, it could have 100% uh, support. Um, so going into Erdico, uh, it's, this is a documentation site we set up. Uh, it's really just a, a micro framework. Uh, we call it the mashup framework because when we use it internally, often it is um, with another system um, or just for a small site. If you want to do a really, really large site, sometimes having all those different bloated symphony components can work to your advantage. When you're doing a mashup, I think they get in the way a lot of times. And you're kind of, you're trying to avoid bloat. Why add more? <laughs> So here is a, uh, what kind of led to uh, development of this uh, framework. Going back here, these are in order to get a fully um, uh, all the code needed for Erdico and uh, Drupal's module. It's literally these three command lines. Uh, this one is. not even much meat into it, but it, it's composer, create project, or deco, or deco, and they give it a folder name. So let me go back to full view. Once you have that, it's gonna create a folder called DrupalCamp. You have a full version of Redico running on the hood. Um, go into that folder, 
and all you do is require a decode Drupal. And they're just standard composer commands. There's nothing new to learn. The idea is if you know web development in the PHP world, we shouldn't be enforcing or twisting your arm too many times. <laughs> it should make sense. Um, so again, kind of the idea is enterprise glue. I and mean, that's kind of a little tagline I came up with. Um, we've used it with Magento, with Drupal, uh, kicked it around, not in a production site, but internally with WordPress and Shopify and some other things. Um, and with some caveats I'll go into later, you could literally have a page that is bootstrapping every single of those um, different applications and pushing out some of the content. In practice, there are, uh, because it's still PHP, if your underlying framework is not uh, namespaced properly, you will have collisions. Um, frameworks moving forward, you'll see less and less than that uh, as an issue. So how does it look? So in Erdico Drupal, this is the module that will allow you to kind of bootstrap and, and suck in data from Drupal with, with very little effort. Um, one of the ways it does it, I'll go into the implementation later, um, is by, by calling a few select uh, pieces from Drupal, which will start the whole instantiation process. After that, as long as I namespace it as the root, which is the first line, I can call any function. Uh, node load, you know, views, view, uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, the next one is kind of a magic method, more OOP looking function, but it's really the same thing. If I have a Drupal model, I attach the node load to it, it's just going to know that at the end of the day, it's just calling root namespace node load. Um, for people who are strict OOP, it kind of makes uh, things a little more palatable. A lot of times, um, it allows you to kind of think in terms of how you're dealing with the data, not necessarily how the framework is dealing with the data. Um, so that's why I think that encapsulation could be pretty handy. Uh, so all the code we'll talk about will be using Erdico. If you don't want to use Erdico as a framework, you can still use that module. So I haven't tested it yet, but in theory, it should work with Symfony and Laravel and a lot of these other composer-based, um, uh, except for one variable, which we could probably move. Uh, it should just work. Um, if it doesn't work and someone tries it, just let me know and we'll, we'll make sure that that's compatible. Because um, some of these modules, we may not even have the opportunity to always use Erdico. So if we're using Symfony or Laravel, we still want to kind of dog food some of our own projects. And so that by keeping it more open, uh, it, it helps everybody, I think. All right, so let's go deep into the code now. So this might be hard to read. Do you know how to? Hey, look at that. Make this a little bigger. So, I, I actually, I'm kind of curious to you guys. Um, since we don't have a, a lot of time, are you more interested in how the bootstrap process works, or more interested in just how to leverage it? So, once it's there and working, it's just plumbing, and you want to pull nodes or pull users. Um, I mean, which part do people find more interesting or more more useful? Oh, okay, okay. Okay, well, I can still give um, an overview of how it's bootstrap, but not go too much into the details. Um, it's less hairy than you'd expect, but it, there was some trial and error. <laughs> there was definitely um, a couple of little gotchas. So let's open up. Here is the Drupal module. So in order to use Drupal, all we do is instantiate either directly or indirectly um, the Drupal model. And it's a very simple model. Mostly what it's doing at this point, it has a magic method to call a Drupal function. Um, the most important thing it's doing is actually loading up uh, Drupal behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, when you look at this module, or, or sorry, this file, um, it's looking to see where Drupal's at. These are a couple of the little details where if, 
if you're running it headless, it's going to start yelling at you if you don't have somebody set. Um, this is where some of the trial and error came in. Came into um, you call the the native Drupal Bootstrap, and then you instantiate or you uh, trigger it. Once this is done, that's it. You have the full API under under the hood. So if we go to an example, so here's an example controller. Um, in the micro framework, we've kept it very lean. There is a theme abstraction, a full MVC. However, um, you can also just like with Symphony, kind of uh, for demo purposes, put everything in the controller. So for demo purposes, there are you'll see a lot more in the controller than should be, uh, but you, it'll help get the point across. So here's the first one. This is get node. So in order to get the node. There's a convenience function here. Um, all it's really doing in the convenience function is uh, node load. So to make that work, you instantiate uh, the node model, call get node, and you have the whole node object. And it's available, in our case, in a bootstrap framework. So there's a Twitter bootstrap theme, theme on there. Um, you know, we could use Angular. We could use all kinds of stuff on the front end. We don't have to worry about core conflicts. It's very uh, agnostic. Um, in our case, we can actually even call Drupal's rendering functions and run it through uh, Drupal's standard um, uh, node uh, theming process and render that out. So let's, let's see what that looks like. So this is just a raw installation with a few examples. Um, this is just Twitter bootstrap under the hood, so you have a very simple, you know, responsive website um, with very little effort. And these are, uh, some of this is configurable, some of it is just explicit as you uh, define your application. Let's go to the Drupal examples. So this is what the code I was just showing you. The first part is the uh, theme node. Uh, which is essentially uh, page title. These are the, the edit features that I'm logged in. This is just a raw dump of what's in that object. This is the same data you get back in any sort of uh, Drupal theme. So it probably looked very familiar to some of you guys uh, or some, some of you folks. And uh, when we go to the other, if you look at a specific example with even media, the media can still show up. So here's a blog post. The, the author image is showing up. The um, embedded image for the actual post is showing up, just as it would on uh, you know, the actual Drupal site. So this is, this is the, the same Drupal site. It's hitting the same database, same code base. It just has a virtual, uh, sorry, a virtual host uh, pointing to the same root. Here. Um, this one, I'm not spitting out the debug details, but I, I think folks get the point. If we go to the users, this is another cool example where I'm just making a, a database call using the Drupal uh, database API and spitting out all users. So, where's that one? We have this example user controller. And we have a function called, I think, this is called all, get all. Here we go. So get all is just saying select users and give me these two fields, uh, push it back out. Um, once I get uh, that push back out, all I'm doing is grabbing the name, uh, creating a link, and putting the user ID in there. Click on it, that's the user. Here is the admin. It's okay. So there is no elaborate profile set up right now in Drupal. It's, it's pretty much out of the box. So there's, uh, if I upload a photo, it'll show up there. Uh, there's full uh, theming capabilities here if you want to take, take control over that, that content. So where it kind of gets a little more exciting, so let me go back. 
um, we, you can start reusing components as, as needed. So in this case, here is oh, that's not right. a bad link in there. I can reuse the built-in Drupal. Um, oh, it's because I'm already logged in. So let me log out. All right. So now that I'm logged out, it'll let me log back in. And the funny thing is that redirect that was happening, that was actually getting pushed out from Drupal. That wasn't even getting pushed out from Hadiko. So this form is literally um, the same form you'd see in Drupal. Same markup, same everything, same security, hash code. And this one, actually it's here. Show you how I did that one. Again, just instantiate a uh, generic Drupal model. All I'm doing is calling Drupal get form, user login. I render it, and I push it out to the front end. So those four lines of code give me a full working login, and I can actually use it. And it still has um, security. So well, it re redirects me back to my user, and I'm logged in. So that's all cool, but for some people, they think that's ugly. So I showed them some default Drupal, and they're just like, ah, oh, they scoff at it because it hasn't been themed yet. <laughs> so what does it look like when it's themed? This is done a little bit differently. I'm just using a um, simple, uh, simple form, but have some uh, styles associated to Twitter Bootstrap on it. And it looks much different. And there's you know, little highlights, and buttons have um, mouse over uh, parameters. So if I look at this one, I just call it login2, for lack of a better name. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm really having to pull from Drupal in this case is the security solve. So I have to still build the form, but instead of rendering the form, all I'm doing is yanking out the build ID, which it uses to uh, do a security handshake. I send that to the, um, to the view layer, and all the view layer is doing is spitting it out. So there's only one line of PHP in this whole form, and it's just spitting out the build ID. Everything else is just plain HTML. Um, and that allows you to still do the same thing. So this form will also log me in. Oops. Let's go back. I haven't added error handling yet. So admin. So now I'm logged in, and same same thing happened as before. So I think that's where you know uh, one of the nice things about being headless is uh, I didn't have to wrap any of these functions; they're just readily available. You could do Google searches. You can you know go through all the the, the Drupal docs. Uh, it, it's really not hard to really find what you're, you're looking for. Yeah, so um, I actually have, to get to the Drupal admin, I have a separate virtual host for that. So if I go, uh, they're going to have, they actually have uh, in, uh, independent sessions. So you, if I was logged into the admin and I was on the Odeco site, it wouldn't know that I'm logged into the admin, but um, it's still using the same user data. So there could be a, there there are ways to abstract that out, but it gets a lot more hairy. Um, if we're using uh, memcache or something else, we could probably do that a lot easier. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see what that other example was. Uh, we can also create users, which is. I gotta log out first, or it won't let me. So I didn't add any fancy error, error, error checking or anything, but it will fail if it isn't a valid user or if it's a user that already exists. Um, two. Oops, I did that backwards.
So now I'm just creating a generic user. And this again is using um, built-in Drupal form. The response I get back from Drupal, I just spit it back out as a, as a debug. So over here we have user get register, um, which is pushing out Drupal get form, user registration form. And the post register um, is where we intercept that form request and um, create an account in, inside Drupal. And then just push out that little debug. Uh, so it's, it's not, not many lines of code. And, and you can kind of pick and choose what pieces are useful for your particular app. So if you're doing a general blog or uh, just a general content website, it's probably overkill unless you have a very, very fancy front end that you know is going to take months to do in Drupal. Um, you could probably do it much more, quicker, uh, much more quickly in some sort of uh, light framework. Uh, but if you're doing web apps, that's where it becomes very, very handy because the way you might write a very complex web app might be completely different than the way you'd write uh, a CMS plugin. Um, some people would argue that's not the case, but I think at scale, it's hard to really argue <laughs> against that. You know. So then, then kind of for fun, I actually tried the same thing, but with um, with WordPress. So here's WordPress. Actually, wrong link. Yeah. So this is using the same thing, uh, a Bootstrap version of WordPress. It's pulling. Um, all the posts I have, which are just two, and spitting it out as a dump. You can theme that in any sort of way, get it to a slideshow, you can uh, start mixing and matching data. So, the interesting one with this with Magento. So, uh, using Magento, same pro. Oh, I have the right link. So this is pulling all the products from uh, Magento, looping through them, and just spitting out the image. Um, this is done in the same way uh, Drupal is bootstrap. So if I go to the Magento module, here we go. Get products. It's just getting a product collection back from um, Magento. One thing you'll notice here is that slash before. So if you're doing general PHP development, no one ever bothers with the slash. That's just saying it's at the root namespace, um, and it won't um, try to find it in a uh, nested uh, class. So I'm grabbing the collection. I loop through, load the product, grab the chopped image from Magento, and just spit it out. So again, a little more coding than, than the Drupal side to do the same thing, uh, but it's still fairly, fairly easy. Uh, you do have to know a few you know, tricks, uh, the Magento API, but it was pretty straightforward. Then it also allows you to mix and match. So this is the part that we're excited about is how can we pull some of these different pieces together and present them all on the same page. So in this case, this is the these are the users from uh, Drupal. These are all the general products. There actually are conflicts between WordPress and Drupal. They do not, <laughs> they don't, they're not friends. So um, the only way to get them to, to, to work together in that same um, design pattern is to hack core in WordPress or Drupal. <laughs> so. You would have to pick and choose, I think, depending on, you could have one as a master and load the others um, independently. So say you authenticate with Magento, but then I want to load my profile from Drupal and my blog post from WordPress. Uh, you just, you could add that as part of your, your, your user model. So you, it, it's very flexible. Yeah. We don't even need to expose APIs because it's really just, here's the model, you define what happens before and after. Um, so it's a little disappointed, but it makes sense. They're both old projects. 
they had the same, both declared a function called a contact form. You know, there's a lot of dumb little things that, um, because they don't use namespaces, they, they collide. Uh, so I, there's probably about five or six different places you'd have to hack in order to make them play nice. Now, you could use the WordPress API. They have a pretty decent built-in API, um, or you can use a plugin. Then, then they could all talk together. Um, but to do the kind of headless version of all three, unfortunately, doesn't work. <laughs> but um, you could very, I could mash up um, Shopify in here. I could add uh, you know, a, a, pretty much any data source or, or local code base. So that pretty much wraps up what I was trying to show on, on you know, the mashups or deco and some different process. Are there any questions or any uh, uh, any thoughts? Yeah. 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 So we we actually built that from the ground up. So it's it's raw PHP. It does use a Toro router. Toro is a micro router. Um, it's kind of uh, similar to uh, Python routing. Um, other than that, uh, it's it's pretty much all. Yeah, yeah. So it's on GitHub. Um, it used to be in my Royal account. Now it's in uh, Royal Labs. Um, but yeah, it's all free, open source. You know, you can redistribute. Um, we're just now starting to add packages because it's, it's Composer, uh, Composer enabled. Uh, so it's, it's been fun. Kind of putting that together, and you know the the documentation is coming together. Uh, there's definitely a lot more than there used to be, uh, but it has a lot of the basics needed to get rolling. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think um, <laughs> it's a lot more work than I, I thought it'd be. It's like, oh, it's just a, uh, originally started out as a regular MVC, and then I decided micro framework makes more sense. I think it's a misnomer because it was still a lot of work because you're trying to keep it to the minimum set, how to make it very, keep it fast, only have what you need. Um, it still gets a little tricky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, uh, how do I not clobber up my own code as well as other people's code? Um, so we, you know, we use namespaces. We now we do have cache built in, uh, and some simple configuration files. Everything's JSON based. Um, yeah, trying to make it kind of more uh, modern web versus the old school PHP, like uh, what was the PHP Renaissance the guy kept saying. <laughs> Go to GitHub real quick. Yeah, so here's the actual framework in there. Um, it's a decent amount of code. It's a lot less code than the old framework. I, I, I took some things from the old framework, but uh, it was basically a rewrite. So it was definitely a lot more work <laughs> than, than I thought. Um, so, John, did you build this initially because of a client or a team and then just expanded it? It kind of came out of, worked at uh, different consulting shops and some different startups, and they all in theory, wanted to do some different uh, mixing and matching of software, but um, it was really hard to get buy-in on architecture. It was really hard to get buy-in on uh, doing it in a reasonable way. Um, and mostly because, it, what was that? Yeah, uh, they, they, everyone wants it you know, fast and cheap, and sometimes that doesn't always <laughs> mean uh, performant or um, efficient. So it kind of it kind of came out of that, and then we started our labs. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of kind of like a personal mission. It's like all right, we built the API Beachman. We built that API from the ground up, and there were definitely some lessons learned there. So it's like how can we make it easier to to just pull in other data and, and make it easy to theme. So the theming engine is also it seems so trivial to oh I just it's just the HTML template I push it out. Um, but to just keep it a consistent and developer-friendly API uh, is not easy. <laughs>
you know, because the Erdico supports uh, Markdown, HTML, you know, PHP templates, and um, handlebars. So you can just, just based off how you name the file, it'll go through the pecking order and, and, and render it. And those are cool too because you know the Markdown support, the handlebar support. It's just another composer package. <laughs> so you know we just made sure we called it properly. And then here are all the different packages. There's the core, Drupal, Magento, um, Shopify. Still a little raw. Uh, our intern built this one, and I think he did a pretty good job. But there's a few things I need to clean up. Um, any other questions? It could be. So if you're using all of them on the same page, you could have um, th th that one request could be really heavy, especially if you're loading Magento, Drupal, you know, three different APIs under the hood. It, it can definitely. Uh, the one nice thing though is you can control the cache. So if you're okay with caching some of those responses, it'll never get bootstrapped. So that's the nice thing about putting everything in the model layer. If I'm caching that data, it never has to, um, if you're catching it in a way where you never have to instantiate the model, you're just pulling like raw data, um, you won't see a uh, performance hit. But that first load is not gonna be pretty. <laughs> cool, well that's it for me. I know it's been a long day, so uh, have, a, have a good weekend. Thank you.